Um, it's my great honor to introduce Ambassador Catherine Tai as this year's Shapiro International Visiting Lecturer. And as, she, as you all know, uh, she is the serving United States Trade Representative. And this means, as I hope all of you know, that she is the principal trade advisor, negotiator, spokesperson on US trade policy and a member of the president's cabinet. So there's lots of great stories here about all of her accomplishments and her, um, her work. I just wanna say, I also dropped the one footnote on this. So among her many accomplishments, uh, uh, Ambassador Tai was once an undergraduate student where we met in college and she wrote a column, the title of which was called The Misanthrope. It was entitled The Misanthrope. I'll just leave that. You can look in the uh, University Archives for them. But that gives you the sense of creativity and color and sort of surprising background to her as well. Okay, so uh, Ambassador Tai is here. I'm not going to take any more time with me. I'm going to give her a time to make a few opening remarks. Um, uh, and then we'll, we'll dive right into this. So thank you so much. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Thank you. It's wonderful to be with all of you. Uh, and okay, let's that's see. it. Yes. Okay. All right. There we go. Uh, now it's really wonderful to be here with all of you. Um, I, uh, I, haven't, I feel like I haven't been in a law school classroom in a while, and I'm having to fight the hives that are kind of like <laughs> rising up. And uh, Well, um, it's really exciting to be here for all of you. Um, I'm here to talk about um, our approach to trade policy today uh, in the Biden administration uh, in the year 2023. And um, uh, I boiled it down to three stories that I'm going to tell you, and then I'll open that up for um, some uh, probing uh, questions and conversation with all of you. Um, the first story I'm going to tell you uh, is going to explain a little bit how I got into doing trade in the first place, because I think that back when we knew each other as undergrads, um, I don't know that trade policy was really something that I spent very much time thinking about. Um, but uh, Julian and I, in addition to um, having been undergrads together at Yale, he was two years ahead of me, and um, having both gone to law school, uh, we did something quite similar in that year or two between college and law school, which is we both spent time in China uh, in the mid 1990s teaching English. Uh, you were there for a year. Uh, I went on a two year program. And so I was there from 1996 to 1998. And um, I had been a history major in college and um, uh, I didn't think much of history in high school either, but uh, at Yale, um, there was this incredible uh, history department and uh, going to lectures two or three times a week, sort of like having uh, season tickets to the Metropolitan Opera. You got to sit and listen to these historians uh, really um, get into their craft and you realize that history was more than just a set of dates and events. It was, it's really about um, telling stories um, through a kind of rigorous application, of research, interpretation. And uh, I think what really spoke to me was uh, that history was telling stories, uh, true stories about ourselves. And that um, history and the telling of history is a way of understanding ourselves. So after four years of majoring in history, I thought, well, this has really been great. Uh, studying history in a classroom like this. Uh, but history is being made every single day. I would like to go and see history being made. So uh, in China, in the mid-1990s, um, so many things were happening and changing there. I think just the two years that I was there from 96 to 98, I spent two years at a university in Guangzhou in the southern province of Guangdong, uh, right there on the Hong Kong border. It was the two years surrounding Hong Kong's return to Chinese rule from being a British colony. And um, it was a really fascinating time because Guangzhou and Guangdong were also um, one at the center of uh, Deng Xiaoping's special economic zones experiment. And the amount of economic activity happening there at the same time that China was negotiating its entry into the World Trade Organization um, 
was just palpable. It was really interesting for me, having grown up in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., with the crate and barrel that had come up in downtown uh, Bethesda and uh, Barnes and Noble. And I thought, well, you know, I'd really like to experience history in a developing country. And somehow in my mind, I thought, uh, because the country would be poorer, that somehow life there would be more noble. Anyway, I got to Guangzhou in the mid-1990s and I realized that people were hurling at light speed towards establishing Barnes and Nobles, Starbucks and Crate and Barrels for themselves. And that there was just this incredible drive as part of human ambition uh, towards um, I don't know, the middle class. So um, I, uh, uh, I, I ultimately came back, went to law school, um, and uh, found myself through my interest in um, understanding what I had seen happening in China in the mid-1990s, uh, coming into the trade uh, field. And uh, here I am today, uh, 20 to 30 years later, um, and uh, so much has changed in the world. Um, so that's maybe the first story I'll tell you, which also explains how I got into trade via this experience that I had in China and how it continues to be an incredibly relevant topic, which I know we'll get into more. Second story I wanted to tell you a little bit about is uh, the origin story of USTR, the U.S. Trade Representative's Office. Uh, not a lot of people know about this uh, little agency. We're about 270 to 300 people full force. That's quite small. In fact, um, uh, components inside of the White House are larger than we are. We are coordinated by the National Security Council which is about 400 people strong. So uh, it's not just my uh, right, but uh, USTRs for me have all griped about uh, being coordinated by an agency that is a component that is even larger than you are. Um, but uh, USTR, what we do in terms of trade policy and trade negotiations, being spokesperson for uh, the administration uh, on trade, uh, we used to be a function of the State Department. And it was in 1962 that Congress finally decided uh, we've had enough of this State Department going around the world, making treaties and making friends and trading away all of these uh, economic benefits. Um, <clears throat> they need to be, they, the executive branch, need to be more sensitive to the economic implications of what they're doing. They need to drive better deals. So they carved USTR and you know, uh, our authorities out of the State Department, moved us into the White House. We are technically a component of the Executive Office of the President, and then made us maximally sensitive to congressional pressure, the two congressional committees, uh, House Ways and Means and Senate Finance. And so there we sit at the intersection of the executive and the legislative branches. We are very much a hybrid child of the two branches. Um, the authority over foreign commerce, for those of you who are doing con law, you will know is an Article I authority. Uh, and uh, the authority for foreign affairs to speak on behalf of the United States with one voice is endowed um, to the uh, Article II branch. Um, so there we sit at the intersection of two powerful branches of government. And uh, we also, um, through our origin story, you understand that we sit at the intersection of foreign policy and also domestic economic policy. And this, I'm going to turn to my notes briefly because there is a very uh, moving floor speech that uh, Senator Bartlett of Alaska gave uh, at the time that we, USTR, will become USTR is being split out of the <laughs> State Department. And uh, his quote is, the State Department testified that we must not embarrass our good neighbor and must keep our relationship with Japan free of avoidable irritations. Now, this is the 1960. And then he says, but I do not think it is fair, I do not think it is just to place upon the Bristol Bay fishermen the burdens of our international commitments to this nation. And I think that that is uh, kind of the um, opening salvo for the creation of USTR. Um, the uh, the last um, story that I wanted to share with you, just to remind myself, uh, is um, I, uh, I I started my government career uh, at USTR as a staff attorney, um, and then in 2014 left USTR to go to the Hill, beginning like really the the political part of my education on trade and trade policy uh, and trade politics, and uh, was working for the House Democrats. 
And this was when the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations were going hot and heavy. It was the last two years of the Obama administration. And uh, there was a lot of uh, furor over the fact that these trade agreements are negotiated in secret, that the documents are classified. In any event, um, USTR would bring over binders of negotiating text and store them in the, um, the secure reading room uh, in the basement of the Capitol. And when members of Congress wanted to go see it, uh, a member of the trade staff would go with them because if you've ever read a trade agreement, which some of you may have, um, I think it is slightly better than um, trying to read computer code. Um, it's, it's not very accessible. So one of us would go down with a member of Congress to essentially explain what they were going to see on the page um, and what the words meant. Um, and as part of that exercise, I got to know a lot of our members of Congress um, as, as people and got to hear their stories more. Um, in one of those trips down to the basement of the Capitol, um, I accompanied uh, Congresswoman Marcy Captor. From Ohio, and I think that she is now the longest serving. She's the longest serving woman in the House. I'll have to go check my stats. Uh, but she is an incredible fighter for her constituents, and she's from um, Central Ohio, uh, and part of the country that has seen um, uh, deindustrialization uh, up front and close, uh, impacted yes by technological advances, but also by our trade policies and that offshoring of. <laughs> Uh, American manufacturing um, that's happened in the last several decades. And uh, as we were talking through the text, she said to me, um, you know, uh, I hate trade. It's still true. I don't think she's ever voted for a trade agreement. And she said, you know, I just wish that of all those smart trade negotiators who work at USTR, uh, that um, they would take a break from traveling all around the world to do those fancy negotiations and they would come to my district and then they would drive around the highways and they would see the hollowing out of our community and of the manufacturing that used to be there. So they could see what the impacts of their negotiations have been on my part of America. And I would just like them to carry that into their negotiations to reflect what's happened because of the way they've conducted their trade policies to my hometown. And so when I was named and then confirmed to be U.S. Trade Representative and President Biden asked me to bring a new approach to trade, one that he wanted to be worker-centered, we can talk more about that if you want, um, that experience with Congresswoman Kaptur was very, very strong in my mind. And so part of what we are doing, which is really different from part of this new approach, different from what we've done before, is um, this job traditionally has the trade rep going to Geneva for the World Trade Organization, anywhere around the world for the G20 trade meetings. I'm going to um, Osaka in a couple of weeks for the G7 trade ministers meeting. You're all over the world doing these trade things. But um, we are consciously trying to put the U.S., back into USTR. If the job is literally to represent the interests of the United States, the entire economy in trade policy and trade negotiations, then how we think about who the United States is, is absolutely critical to what we're going to be asking for and how we're going to be representing our interests. So um, the domestic travel that I do, my challenge to myself and my team is, <laughs> to try to match every international trip with the domestic trip. So that as we are engaging internationally in those trade conversations, we are expanding out how we are thinking about the United States. We are pushing ourselves outside of Washington DC, knowing that if you just stay put in Washington, your conception of who the United States is is going to be limited to those people who already know you exist, who know how to find you, who know how to speak your language, and in most cases have the resources to hire the lobbyists who used to work there. Um, so, you know, from our perspective, it really is about democratizing economic opportunity and democratizing this fairly esoteric field of international trade um, so that more Americans will see themselves in what we're doing. And that also means that we fully expect that our trade policies will look different in order to reflect 
um, the diversity of our economic interests, the fact that we are not all um, uh, fintech or or you know uh, digital tech uh, folks, um, that uh, there are all kinds of people, all kinds of skills, and all kinds of uh, sectors that make up our economy. So I will stop there. And uh, uh, I'm back in your hands, Troy. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Um, and this is a really great remarks and really illuminating and also avoid some of the questions, answer some of the questions I was going to ask. I'll save time. Let me just, I'm going to ask two questions and then I'll open the floor. I have some, I asked students to pre-submit some questions. I'll recognize some of the students to ask questions and we'll sort of get, all right. So first question is, building off what you're saying, I think it's really, a really fascinating vision. I love the way you put the U.S. back in USTR. I, I, um, I love that as a slogan. I'm not sure I love this policy, but um, I, I do wonder, I want to have a couple questions about your thought about your relationship with Congress. So I think it isn't unique that you have this experience coming over from working directly in Congress and now working in the executive branch. And I think that's great. I think uh, it's great the USTR, but I think I want to maybe give you a chance to sort of respond to some criticism that your office has been getting about uh, the use of sole executive trade agreements or the use of executive agreements. And here's the constitutional law part coming in. So those of you, in other words, uh, not uh, trade agreements typically are sent through a process set up by Congress through trade promotion authority or other mechanisms. And they're approved by both houses of Congress. Um, and in the dark past, they would have been done through treaties, but either way, Congress would have had a role and I think you've probably noticed that some scholars and trade people have been concerned about agreements that you've, uh, your office has recently negotiated that seem to be not being, they're not going to be sent to Congress. The, the Taiwan Initiative, the Japan, uh, the recent agreement with Japan. So what do you think is the right, as a lawyer, maybe, uh, what do you think is the right role? Where do we draw a line? And, and is there a danger that your office is taking a little power away from Congress by uh, in, Sort of going forward with these types of agreements. So I describe our agency as a as a child of both branches, right? Created by Congress, put in the executive branch, where uh, our authorities are derived from both branches, also delegated from Congress, but also deriving from the foreign affairs powers of the executive. Um, I myself see uh, see see myself as a child of both parents. Um, and, uh, you know, having grown up in a household with um, two parents of very different personalities, I feel like I continue to channel those skills of, you know, trying to see things from both points of view and understanding why we're in the jam that we're in. So uh, I guess what I would say is this, as a legal matter, uh, agreements that we negotiate uh, under our authorities need to go to Congress when we need to change some aspect of U.S. law in order to implement what we have agreed to. When we negotiate things that we already do, that are already settled matters of law or uh, that require only executive action that has uh, that resides in executive authority, there is no legal requirement to submit the agreement to Congress for approval or implementation, right? Uh, so uh, the things that we are negotiating right now are in fact things that are not requiring tariff changes, that is generally the core of the things that uh, we require, we have required Congress to do when we have submitted past traditional uh, free trade agreements to Congress. It's basically to get Congress to agree to either fully eliminate tariffs immediately or agree to a schedule for reduction or elimination over time. And then there may also be adjustments to um, some regulations where you read in some countries to uh, regulatory processes that, that we've established domestically. So as a legal matter, uh, we are fully within our rights under our delegated authorities. And um, uh, the Taiwan Agreement, for instance, requires zero changes in US law. Now, what was really interesting in that one is um, this Congress, this Congress, the one, the one that has a house right now that has no speaker. And as last time I checked, the news still continues not to have a speaker. Still no speaker. Um, actually got together and fairly quickly moved a trade bill, which was uh, a congressional, essentially, stamp of approval on the thing that we had done with Taiwan. Um, so uh, what that told us, one, is it is possible for Congress to act on trade. 
It is possible when they are all four corners, equally angry at us, which is great. They can be motivated. On the other hand, I don't know if it's replicable or how we replicate it. There are tons of things that I would love to do with Congress right now, including um, establishing some kind of authority and new sets of tools for helping to establish, to create and incentivize more resilient supply chains. Because if there's one thing that we all know is what a supply chain is today in 2023 post pandemic. And the other thing we know is that tons of our supply chains are really fragile and break easily under pressure. So um, I would love for Congress to be able to get back in the game, but I think that we're really at an inflection point in terms of the, um, the direction of our trade policies and what problems we're trying to solve with trade. And I'll just take this back one point to um, TPP, which I mentioned earlier, the Trans-Pacific Partnership this is this big 12 country, uh, giant comprehensive liberalizing trade agreement that uh, the Obama administration had finished negotiating. Uh, and it sat um, uh, basically for all of 2016. It was signed in February of 2016. And it sat trying to find a path to congressional ratification in 2016, which is also inconveniently an election year. Um, and uh, we didn't get it across the finish line. I think that there were some hopes that um, uh, in the event of a Hillary Clinton victory, that uh, the Congress would move it quickly through a lame duck, but that is not in fact what happened. We had Donald Trump win. There is actually, I think, a correlation between Donald Trump's win and uh, the fact that TPP had been pending and a big part of his campaign pitch. And it was in the first days of Donald Trump, a Republican president's presidency, that he actually completely withdrew the United States from that 12 country pact. And so I think that the lesson that I take from that is um, the trade policies as we had been pursuing them have become so fragile. The implications of that withdrawal from TPP, I continue to live with and have to work with every single day. The um, impact, the negative impact to our credibility as a trading partner, our impact as a government in terms of the promises that we had made to our farmers who have a lot to gain generally from the TPP, and then also the discord that we had sown with our manufacturing producers or domestic producers and our manufacturing workers. See footnote on where Donald Trump's margins were of victory in 2016 have caused us to be extremely thoughtful about how we construct our trade policies going forward, that they have to be durable for our own credibility's sake. And I think that one of the challenges that I have with Congress right now is that if I were to say to Congress, hey, let's make a deal like we've done before with TPA, you've delegated all these authorities to us, but uh, in order to get some procedural protections from you, uh, we would be willing to take on some extra burdens and instructions from you on exactly what you want us to be negotiating and how. The problem is that I do not think we could get 218 votes in the House or 60 votes in the Senate on a unifying vision for what we should be doing. And so to be pragmatic in the meantime, because we can't stop trading with the rest of the world, uh, there is an incredible foreign policy push for us to be back in the Asia-Pacific this is our solution for now. Is this where I think we should be or where we ought to be in the long term or the medium term? No, but I think that this is sort of our our, um, our bridge solution until we get um, a more clear uh, uniformity as a whole USG on what it is we're trying to accomplish. Okay, that's, that's great. That's a very illuminating answer, um, which... Uh, it's very, it's very interesting. I think that it gives me some, I'm a pro trade guy, so I'm very excited about some future where we get back to uh, the trade agreement. But I, I think that's fair for you to dump on Congress a little. I think they are, um, I think it's true. It's hard to imagine Congress right now getting together on, on a trade promotion authority or any other agreement on this front. All right. One more question from me, and then I'm going to turn it over to students. And here I do have to push you a little harder now. Um, because I think I, I, I hear your worker-centered trade policy. I hear what you're saying. I think there's many great uh, and understandable things about that. But I think the, you are a litigator at the World Trade Organization on behalf of the United States for many years. This is 
I think, an incredible experience. I think not that many USTRs actually had that experience, not just negotiating on behalf of the United States, but actually litigating cases with other countries and trade disputes, which um, the ambassador did. Um, but the U.S. government is now being blamed for blocking the reforms of the World Trade Organization's dispute resolution body. And to put it to you bluntly, I teach a class in international trade law. Most of our case cases are decisions of the World Trade Organization or GATT. And that, that organization is not moving forward because, according to our critics, or critics of because the United States government and to put it bluntly, your office. <laughs> um, and so do you have a vision for how we would ever get back to a way where the USTR is going, to, or the United States can work with the World Trade Organization dispute settlement body? So this is where I'm going to tell a whole story about Julian. He's a background <laughs> on our relationship. And uh, he's been, you know, been very, like, um, but uh, uh, Julian's one of the greatest intellects that I came across in my career years of college. Um, our politics are very different, but I have uh, the utmost respect uh, for Julian. In college, uh, Julian was uh, part of a rather uh, right-wing um, uh, faction of students, which is a bit unusual, right, at a place like Yale in the 1990s. But, um, uh, and I have several friends who uh, hung out in this part of the political spectrum, uh, all of them incredibly smart. And what I took away from um, uh, just being around you and Naomi and Mark um, was uh, your capacity to challenge the rest of us. And I don't think you ever use this term, but and I hope that you will, you'll, you'll, you'll let me know if you really hate this. It was a little bit of that kind of like shock therapy um, in, a, in, a, in a pretty kind of uh, liberal culture of, um, you know, essentially holding up a mirror to the rest of us and saying, um, do you recognize that uh, you all are kind of liberal sheep? That you have, you have just, you are relying on a whole bunch of assumptions that you've never questioned before. Question them, question them, right? Question them and if you come out still, doubling down and endorsing what you thought you had to leave before, great. We can agree to disagree and we can come out in different places. But that act of questioning is really important and actually is a really important part of mm, that intellectual journey in college. So I guess what I would say, Julian, is now um, pushing 50 years old, and I know you're already over. Well, 50 over. Years old. <laughs> I'm two years younger, remember. Um, you know, I find myself in your shoes. I get critiqued a lot. I absorb a lot of um, uh, denigration. Um, it's so interesting. Um, it's interesting how many people, well-heeled people in our society, journalists and think tankers, uh, will talk to me like I am an idiot. And I think that the issue is I feel like my mandate now is to hold up the mirror to everybody else and say, aren't you just a neoliberal sheep? Have you questioned the assumptions on which you are basing your worldview? And if you have, and if you're willing to question with me, and we come out in different places, so be it. In fact, that's a conversation I would be really interested in having because it might help me to focus some of my thinking too. But um, I come up against a foreign policy establishment, a business establishment, an intellectual establishment every single day who believes that um, free trade was the way to peace and prosperity. Ignore all of the data points, especially from these last five to seven years, and it's what we we should be pursuing and, um, uh, you know, um, let's uh, get back on track. Um, and I think that, you know, whether it was a backlash against globalization in 2016 and the Brexit vote and in the election of Donald Trump here, uh, whether it was the pandemic and all of the supply chain failures that we've seen since, the uh, 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 rising geopolitical tensions with China, open war between Russia and Ukraine, uh, and then I don't even know how to make sense of what's happening in the Middle East right now, except to say that uh, the world keeps feeling more and more complicated. Let me back up, so having recognized that um, I am still um, uh, learning and processing, I think, with everybody else, uh, the latest events um, in Israel with the Hamas terrorist attacks, 
Um, and, you know, I don't think that trade policy is the obvious first thing to be uh, uh, connecting to. But um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, I think that for a while, the end of history, you know, the um, uh, the vanquishment of the, um, uh, the Cold War um, uh, conflict, we had this very glib assumption that two countries that have McDonald's would never go to war with each other. And let me tell you, last time I checked, pre-invasion of Ukraine, there were McDonald's all over Russia and Ukraine. And so, uh, you know, free trade, trade liberalization, the more we trade with each other, it did generate a lot of prosperity, number one. I think the prosperity, like most trickle-down policies, uh, managed to collect in certain places and not trickle down very easily. Uh, the second point is um, the prosperity coexisted with peace. But we've seen that the prosperity doesn't guarantee peace. So I think we just need to rethink how do we do trade? How could we harness liberalization as a tool to promote higher goals, at least higher goals for now in the economic global situation we have, where I think the higher goals are not just trade more with each other, but uh, how can you trade with each other to promote resilience, to be able to cushion our economic lives against future crises? Uh, see more and more crises happening. Two, sustainability. I think that when you talk to the businesses, they are really keyed into the sustainability question because they recognize that in order to keep making a profit, they need to continue to have a runway to, to move down. And then uh, the third one is inclusivity, the widening uh, inequality in terms of income. And on this one, I just uh, give a hat tip to uh, uh, Sean Fink, who's the president of the United Auto Workers. Uh, we can talk about that too, but maybe later, um, who uh, who I invited to a meeting of um, Asia Pacific trade ministers uh, when we were hosting that meeting in Detroit. We're in the UAW's backyard. So I invited um, the new UAW president and also the secretary treasurer of the AFL to come and speak to our trade ministers to describe how they see trade policy, how they've seen it in the past and what they would like to see in the future. And uh, President Fain, um, you know, quoted uh, a, a statistic, um, which I've seen him do since as well, which is 50% of the world, of the world's wealth, which is a lot because the world as a whole is very wealthy. 50% of the world's wealth is currently held by 26 individual billionaires. And if you just think about that gap, uh, between the top, whatever percent it is, there's what, like uh, 7 billion people, 26 over 7 billion, and um, uh, where the wealth is collecting in our economy and the world economy, that's not sustainable. And so really, truly, I think at the end of the day, what we are trying to do is, um, uh, through a worker-centered trade policy, we are trying to reform the way we do trade we're trying to reform our version of capitalism and our democracy in order to save them. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I have some further thoughts, but I'll save them for later when I get a chance. Uh, but let me just uh, open this. I have a couple, several, a bunch of you actually submitted questions ahead of time. I don't think we're gonna have time for everyone. Let me start with a couple. Let me start with Mr. Healy. Mr. Healy. Yes, okay, so uh, please go ahead with your question. Thanks. Yes, good afternoon, and thank you for coming to speak with us. I was curious, what do you believe is the United States' greatest weakness on the trade front that perhaps other countries that you get to work with are particularly strong in that your administration wishes to emulate? That we're trying to emulate, but well, we're weak in and uh, others are strong in. Um, okay, let me come at it in, in two different directions. First one is, um, if any of you have been to Asia recently, and recently I mean like the last 10 years, um, I don't know if you've had any experience, but when you come back to the U.S. from a trip to most parts of Asia, do you also feel like you have gotten it out of a time machine? I think that, um, I'll give you another example, and this is really about infrastructure investment. Um, when you watch movies that are set in the near future, how often are those movies shot in Shanghai? <laughs> I think quite often, um, and uh, uh, one of the reasons for that is because of this incredible um, current investment 
in infrastructure that's happening in certain parts of the world. Here, until the bipartisan infrastructure law, and I think that, you know, that funding is in the process of going out, and we won't probably see all of the changes um, uh, uh, until maybe in the next couple years. Uh, but we have been largely coasting off of massive infrastructural investment in ourselves that was done in the Eisenhower administration. I don't even know when that was. It was so far before when I was born. That, that was when the LIE was built. <laughs> <laughs> that was when the LIE was built. Okay. All right. So I think that that's one thing I would say is um, you see a lot of the up and coming economies um, investing robustly in themselves. Um, I would say, you know, investing through their education policies in their people. And I think for us, there has been this kind of let the market take care of everything here. And over time, what I've seen is that, um, you know, uh, like the market, the, the, the market could use some correction. And I think that we're in a moment for that. Um, the other point I would say in terms of, you know, uh, showing up in these international uh, negotiations, and this is less about emulating others or being inspired by others, but uh, I am keenly aware of the fact that um, you know, you'll hear President Biden talk about democracy a lot, right? And he'll do it in the international forums, and that's where we traditionally talk about democracy. But he does it just as much at home now. And what I'm keenly aware of when we show up in negotiations is the degree to which our um, lack of consensus here at home, um, the, the tensions in our social fabric hold us back from being able to fully engage. And that goes back to that credibility as an international partner. If I, I have to keep thinking about, you know, what's the limit of what, what I can assert or commit to in these forums so that I'm not breaking a very fragile, if non-existent consensus at home. I mean, constantly going through that analysis. And I think that that's something, that's something we are going through here that has a direct implication on what we're doing. So, you know, it's like the Bristol Bay fishermen, uh, the Senator Bartlett wanting to make sure that negotiators know what the domestic economic implications are for doing in foreign policy. You should also know that what we do in foreign policy uh, is also limited by or enabled by uh, what is um, uh, supported here at home. Okay, thank you. Sadly, we have time for one last question. So um, I thought we'd give the opportunity to one of my students who's here this semester from China, Mr. Uh, if you could ask your question, um, but in English. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, Professor. Uh, as, as you mentioned, that the United States is so opportunity and uh, contribute a lot to trade and other links to China's current system as the second economy in the world. So I wonder, according to the blueprint of the United States, is there an idle role that China should have played in the global supply chain now and the near future? Thank you so much. So is the question, um, what is the role that China should play? What is the ideal role? Ideal role that China should from play. From the U.S. From the U.S. perspective. Okay. Um, so I'll come at this from a, um, a particular perspective. Um, I think that China has been um, so effective in its um, industrial and trade policies over the last 20, 30 years uh, that it has um, uh, managed to corner the market, if you will corner the international market on a lot of production and supply. So many supply chains will run through China now. And I think that from our perspective, even you look at the conversation around critical minerals and say rare earths, rare earths are in so many of the things that are in our technology and a renewable tech. Um, and China is really the, do the dominant producer in the world. So if we think about what our industrial aspirations are in EVs, electric vehicles, and electrification, and renewable energy, um, in just, you know, the cell phones, every cell phone has some rare earths in it, right? And we realize that, wow, um, we are only getting this. We are so incredibly reliant on China. And so from my perspective, from a supply chain design or supply chain incentives that we could create through trade, creating more supply chains that run through more different places, in my mind, helps create more resilience and shock absorption in the global economy. Okay, well, that's a great, that's a great response. Um, 
And I thank you so much for being so honest and 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 and, and, and forthright with us. And um, this is really a great honor. And I really want to. Fortunately, we have a hard stop because there's a class in this room in a few minutes. So I'm sure. Uh, so I want to. But I really want to thank everyone for being here. I want to thank you, the ambassador, for your time. Thank you so much.